Good afternoon or good evening to all participants. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Elfina from ISAP Indonesia, and I will be responsible for moderating this webinar today. Today, we have three speakers who will share about new psychoactive substance. But before we get started, I'd like you to know that you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your question into the question pane on the control panel. You may send your question at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Afif Weinstein. Professor is the Isidore and Ruth Casti Chair for Brain Research from the Department of Behavioral Science, Ariel University, Israel. And he will give presentation about psychostimulants. Professor Afif, the floor is yours. All right. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. I'm going to talk today about a novel uh, psych psychostimulants. And as you can see in the picture here, uh, this is the cut plant that is grown in uh, not far from here in the Arab Peninsula, also in uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and other places. And this is one of the, the uh, natural ingredients of psychostimulants, a uh, novel uh, psychostimulants. Um, first, we'll start with uh, some epidemiology, and then later um, some uh, psychopharmacology and the effects of uh, psychostimulants. And you can see in this report of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, a description of the uh, regional diversity and the impact of uh, novel psychoactive uh, substances. This has been released in April 2021. And the figures show that there is an increase in the use of NPs worldwide. <clears throat> and you can see from 2009 until 2019, a steady increase in all types of novel psychoactive substances. The, the four classes that are very popular are the uh, synthetic cannabinoids, uh, the stimulants, uh, the uh, <coughs> synthetic uh, opioids, and classical hallucinogens, but there are also other dissociative and sedatives that have been developed. And in a meeting in 2017 17 in the UNODC, we saw that through the years, um, quite a dramatic increase in the manufacturing of a novel psychoactive drugs. They've been uh, widespread around the world and, uh, and in a steady increase. Um, as you can see here, the, 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 there is a division of the different NPs uh, between 2009 and 2019, and you can see a steady growth in the number of these compounds. For example, on the right hand, the stimulants, on the left hand, synthetic cannabinoids. There used to be a pace of around 100 new uh, synthetic cannabinoids a year. But there's also an increase in the classic hallucinogens, synthetic opioids, especially synthetic fentanyl, uh, sedatives and hypnotics, and dissociative drugs. Uh, what is interesting uh, is that the, uh, the annual number of uh, different NPs reported uh, is increasing if you look at the different regions of the world, for example, North America and Asia, and Asia follows generally uh, the similar trend of the, of the um, US and North America. And, uh, the, and one of the differences is that uh, the number of synthetic opioids and sedatives hypnotics continues to rise, to rise significantly. This is a trend that we see uh, recently. Um, and so NPs um, have been increasing uh, worldwide, but in Asia, there is a trend of, uh, of a decrease of uh, some of the NPs compared with, uh, on the right hand, as you can see, uh, some uh, decrease compared with the increase that we can see globally, uh, in particular in, in, in the psychostimulants. 
that means that there are, there's no development of new uh, psychostimulants. And soon we will see what kind of psychostimulants we are dealing with. And um, so there, there, as I said, there is a decrease in diversity, um, in particular with synthetic stimulants and cannabinoids. Um, and uh, so um, in this way, it is different from the worldwide trend. Um, on the other hand, um, one of the trends is that one psychostimulant, mephedrone, uh, which is derived from, uh, from catinone, this is actually uh, has increased since 2018, while the other psychostimulants have decreased. This particular one has increased in its, uh, um, in its use. Now, um, let's see what is methadone and the other psychostimulants. Well, the origin of it is cut or gut, which is a natural plant uh, growing in Africans' horn and the Arab Peninsula. We have described it in our, our study, Weinstein, Roska, Fator in London, 2017. And this is not a particularly dangerous drug. It's been grown for uh, and exists for thousands of years as a social custom. And in Yemen, there are 44 types of cut. It's very popular in Yemen. And the World Health Organization in, in uh, 1980 has defined cut as an addictive drug that can cause a light uh, or medium dependence. And, and the reason it's that is that people are chewing the, uh, the leaves of the plant and you need quite a lot of leaves in order to develop severe psychotic uh, experiences, although some people have managed to do that in Somalia. And um, cathinol is the main psychoactive ingredient in the cut. It is in the leaves and uh, people chew it, particularly mainly men. And uh, it's used for recreational purposes. Women use it to treat headache or to lose weight because it's a psychostimulant and men find it uh, stimulating or arousing. And uh, we have reviewed quite a lot of evidence worldwide about um, the use of catinones in the US. It is particularly uh, popular among males with, in the age between 18 to 24, Caucasians uh, holding college education and um, mainly uh, using it uh, intranasal. And it has quite similar effects to cocaine or amphetamine. Uh, people find it uh, um, uh, as a pleasurable drug. On the other hand, uh, when uh, um, we are dealing with synthetic catenones, those are manufactured from, uh, uh, from the plant and also uh, uh, some other substances are probably added. This is uh, a more dangerous drug and uh, synthetic catenones uh, are known to increase sexual desire and sexual risk taking behavior. Uh, it is in the general public, but also particularly among uh, homosexual men in North US. Um, and most or then the, more than half of the respondents in one of the surveys met a DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for substance related disorder. It is less popular than marijuana and uh, cocaine or synthetic cannabinoids, methamphetamine and MDMA. <clears throat> the chemical structure of cathinone is uh, similar to amphetamine. If you look here on the right side, you, you see cathinone, on the left you see uh, amphetamine. And um, uh, the cut uh, plant has lots of uh, ingredients, alkaloids, uh, uh, flavonoids, amino acids, vitamins, and uh, minerals. And when cathinone, cathinone is digested, it is metabolized into two different substances. One of them is a pseudoephedrine, and the other one is, as you can see on the left side, on the right side, you see norephedrine. And um, what are the effects of catenones in general? Uh, there is, uh, first of all, it's increasing uh, arousal and insomnia by virtue of releasing adrenaline. It is increasing euphoria by virtue of affecting the certain the sort of energetic system and um, 5-HT depletion in the uh, striatum. 
And the third effect that is similar to amphetamines, it has some repetitive movements in, in rats. It peaks at about 30 minutes, lasts for three hours, and it is metabolized in the liver to uh, norephedrine. Uh, in terms of behavioral medical effects, there's a higher heart, heart rate similar to other stimulants. Uh, it causes a rise in blood pressure, sweating, expansion of blood vessels, and there may be a risk of heart attack in heavy users. Uh, other effects are arousal, hyperactivity, excitement, aggression, anxiety, and mania in the laboratory. And finally, there is some interaction, not a strong interaction with the dopamine system, and of reward in rats, it has been shown by the dopamine receptor D1. So you can see here in the picture a rise in systolic and diastolic blood, blood pressure after in, in ingestion of catenones and also an increase in heart rate here in the middle, blood pressure in the, uh, and on the top. Now, um, how can you stop the effect of catenones when people use such a stimulant? Since it's not a direct agonist of dopamine, but just releases dopamine, there may be a uh, use for some medications that work similarly to, for the, to the treatment of cocaine and other stimulants. And uh, for example, uh, dopamine antagonists like haloperidol or drugs that block, do, block dopamine release can inhibit uh, catenone. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a possible treatment for an agonist bromocryptin, uh, dopamine agonist that can reduce craving and withdrawal symptoms from catenones uh, in 24 hours. The uh, synthet this is so far about catenones, about synthetic catenones, it's a broad class of pharmacologically active compounds and there are lots of effects that and different mechanisms of action. Uh, it is similar to uh, psychostimulants and it works on the um, uh, transporters of the monoamine uh, neurotransmitter, uh, neurotransmitters dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. <clears throat> we need to know that there are several different types of synthetic catenones. I've mentioned earlier methadrone, and uh, methadrone and methylone um, are the main uh, compounds, but also MDPV. Uh, Mephedrone and methylone are agonists of uh, the uh, non-selective transporter agonists. Therefore, they release the release of uh, serotonin, adrenaline, and dopamine. Whereas uh, MDPV, the third compound, is a blocker of the catecholamine transporter with little effect on the serotonin transporter. The um, um, when uh, uh, preclinical studies with rats have been performed, we can see that methadrone or methylone increase uh, the concentration of dopamine and serotonin in the brain. And in that way, they are very similar to the drug ecstasy or MDMA. Uh, and generally, synthetic catenones elicit locomotor stimulation in rodents like other stimulants. That is shown by repetitive uh, activity. And the, um, the fact that they also release dopamine means that they have high potential for addiction because they activate the dopamine reward system. And there were several uh, behavioral studies in, in rodents with, uh, with catenones showing a, a significant effects of uh, place reference, for example, and some cardiovascular effects. Now, what are the acute and long-term effects of the methcatinones? As, as, so, uh, in terms of the acute effects, uh, it's a rise in heart rate, body temperature, uh, and the chronic effects are anxiety, depression, and even psychosis. There are several document effects of uh, even uh, violent deaths, violent deaths caused by people who use synthetic catinones. Very few, but, but uh, th there are. Mephedrone and methylone bind to the monoamine transporter, and they are very similar to ecstasy. They are mainly working on serotonin 5-HT, but they have little effect on, on amphetamine. In that way, they are different from other drugs like uh, methamphetamines, for example. Now, these are the, uh, uh, the types of drugs that uh, are synthetic uh, 
things that we know about, but I just wanted to to finalize with uh, another drug that is emerging, and this is a report of UNODC uh, from January uh, 2022 about a production in Afghanistan of tablet K, uh, which is a new uh, compound in the market. And you can see these kind of shapes and, uh, of, of these tablets, and they, they contain uh, methamphetamine and other uh, compounds. And in Afghanistan, there is an increase in the, in the quantities of methamphetamine that have been seized between 2015 until 2019. And um, you can see that in the last few years, there's a much higher um, uh, um, uh, quantity of, um, of amphetamine in Afghanistan. And tablet K, you can see in different shapes and forms. Um, they are many different uh, funny faces, as you, as you can see. And some of them contain MDMA, and some of them contain methamphetamine. And you can see here uh, methamphetamine, heroin, um, lidocaine, diazepam, and caffeine in this type, B1. In type A3, there is MDMA. B4, methamphetamine, heroin, lidocaine, caffeine as well. And the C5 has got methamphetamine, heroin, um, caffeine, sildenafil, and other tablets. And so there are different uh, shapes and forms. The ones on the right here contain MDMA, the, the drug ecstasy, which is a very popular psychostimulant. Now, um, you can see here that if you divide it, you can see that lots of samples contain methamphetamine, some of them MDMA, some of them don't have methamphetamine or MDMA or other substances. And what is worrying about it is that there's an increasing number of, uh, of these uh, substances and uh, this can be a major uh, threat because methamphetamine is quite a dangerous drug with severe uh, side effects. And here I can show you some slides from the year 2001 by and Nora Volkov and her group showing that uh, people who uh, use methamphetamine, who are abusers of methamphetamine, show reduced um, uh, uh, dopamine occupancy in the dopamine transporter. You can see on the right side, side this is the striatum in a methamphetamine abuser. And on the left side, you can see a comparison subjects with quite healthy striatum. You can see the, the, the red parts of it. And this looks a bit deformed. And the scan was 80 days after detoxification. And Volkov and her colleagues followed up patients after they stopped using methamphetamine. And they found lots of uh, negative effects, like a reduction in the ability to perform motor tasks, memory tasks. And these were usually associated with the reduction in, uh, in the occupancy of the dopamine transporter. And some of them show deficits that are similar to those of Parkinson's disease patients. And another negative effect of methamphetamine is the effect of reduction of gray matter in the brain. And you know that gray matter is very important for cognitive or auto function, and um, those who are methamphetamine abusers show um, <clears throat> a reduced uh, um, gray matter volume um, compared with healthy controls and uh, in, in quite a few major, measured areas in the cerebral cortex. So if I want to uh, conclude my talk, the first thing is that there is a decrease in diversity of NPs in Asia, in particularly synthetic uh, CMOX stimulants and cannabinoids, but an increase in mephedrone since 2018. Mephedrone is a mild stimulant, is very similar to ecstasy. You can see similar effects on the brain and behavior, uh, such as uh, after the use of ecstasy, and it works on 5-HT. <clears throat> the good news about it is that uh, a brain imaging studies show that uh, when people stop using ecstasy and mild psychostimulants, the brain, the brain returns to normal <coughs> levels of uh, 5-HD occupancy. On the other hand, methamphetamine is a major health risk 
It's a dangerous cytostimulant causing long-term neural damage. Some of the neural neurons do not grow to, uh, do not return to the normal uh, development and severe co cognitive and motor impairments. And here I conclude my talk and uh, I'll be ready for questions afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Afif, uh, for the a very clear presentation about psychostimulants, uh, particularly catenone, synthetic catenone, and also the new emerging uh, psychostimulants, uh, tablet K. Uh, so uh, we will continue on the second presentations. Uh, and for the participants, uh, you may you may text your quest, uh, text question from the control panel. Now I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Joe Pierre, who will giving us a presentation on synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, he's a health science clinical professor from David Given School of Medicine, UCLA, United States. So Dr. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be giving this talk to people all over the world. It's um... I guess we could say it's the one positive thing that's come from the pandemic, the ability to reach out uh, like this. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about synthetic cannabinoids. And let me make sure I can advance my slides. No conflicts of interest to report. So the phenomenon of synthetic cannabinoids is relatively new, and many of us first heard about it through this word called spice. So what is spice? Well, in 2005 or 2004, herbal mixtures of plant material that were marketed as spice, as well as other trade names like K2 or Mojo, these products began to appear in Europe and the United States. If you looked at the product labeling, they were labeled as incense or aromatherapy or herbal potpourri. And it even said on the package, not for human consumption. However, it was very clear that these products were being sold for human consumption. And very quickly, we determined that um, these uh, herbal materials had psychoactive effects uh, and that they contained variable amounts of synthetic cannabinoids. They were packaged in very colorful um, uh, wrappers uh, under a variety of different brand names. And many of them um, had packaging that suggested that the target consumer was young people by virtue of the kinds of advertisements that they used. So when we talk about the herbal components or the plant material, a wide variety of different herbal ingredients have been found in these products. Uh, many of these are chosen deliberately because they do have some psychoactive um, uh, activity. Uh, Herbs like dwarf skull cap have some uh, psychoactive activity that is uh, similar, reminiscent to cannabis. But beyond the herbal materials, uh, what was determined is that these, the, these products also contain synthetic cannabinoids. Now, what are synthetic cannabinoids? Synthetic cannabinoids are chemicals that were originally developed in research laboratories back in the 1960s in order to study and understand the endocannabinoid system. One of the pioneers of synthetic cannabinoids was a, a professor named J.W. Huffman who worked here in the United States for Clemson University. And when Spice products came about, he was interviewed quite a bit by various media outlets one of his infamous quotations was to say that THC, which of course is the active ingredient in cannabis, is a rather mediocre cannabinoid. So by way of contrast, if we look at various synthetic cannabinoids that were again developed in the laboratory, you can see, I think you can see my pointer, that uh, THC is a partial agonist at cannabinoid type one receptors, but many of these other agonists are full so non-selective agonists, and if you look at the receptor binding affinity, many of them, for example, this one, HU210, has a much, much higher binding affinity. So compared to THC, many of these synthetic cannabinoids uh, bind much more strongly to cannabinoid receptors, and they are much more potent in terms of their activity at cannabinoid receptors. That said, 
uh, each one differs from one another. So when we talk about synthetics, we're not talking about a single uh, molecule, we're talking about a wide variety. And so here, for example, is one recent paper's attempt to classify these various um, cannabinoids by their chemical class. And you can see that depending on the uh, drug in question, it might have different uh, specific activities and potencies of those activities at cannabinoid receptors. So let's jump ahead now that we have some understanding of synthetic cannabinoids and talk about the effects and particularly the adverse effects. So here's another quotation by Professor Huffman. He was on record saying that smoking a compound with unknown biological properties in humans is a stupid thing to do. So if we look at the somatic effects of synthetic cannabinoids, they are pretty far and wide affecting a number of different organ systems. So I'm a psychiatrist, so I tend to be most interested in those things related to the brain. Uh, and you can see a variety of different <clears throat> neurological consequences, including most prominently psychosis, anxiety and agitation, as well as seizures. Cardiac manifestations, uh, uh, adverse events are also very common. They include tachycardia and other types of arrhythmia, uh, some cases of myocardial infarction. The renal system, acute kidney injuries, very common uh, outcome. Also, rhabdomyolysis, uh, digestive symptoms like vomiting, uh, and some cases of death. Uh, causality, not totally clear, but certainly associationally, there have been case reports of people who have died in the context of acute synthetic cannabinoid use. Now, uh, this is a study published in uh, 2016 looking at a database of case reports about people who presented usually to emergency settings uh, with synthetic cannabinoid toxicity. So it gives you some idea of the frequency of these different events. So tachycardia, agitation, and drowsiness, very common. But you can see that psychiatric symptoms and psychosis specifically are also fairly frequent uh, presentations occurring in about five, six, seven percent of patients, hallucinations, psychosis, delusions, and paranoia. Um, additionally, there have been, um, I don't have a slide for it, but there have been a number of different associational studies showing a um, association between acute synthetic cannabinoid use and the development of psychosis, not only in people with pre-existing psychotic disorders, but also new onset psychosis. And in at least a handful of those cases, uh, that psychosis has persisted beyond uh, intoxication and withdrawal, uh, oftentimes lasting several months, if not uh, longer. So there is some indication that synthetic cannabinoid use might be able to trigger uh, the development of a psychotic disorder, similar to how we've observed with uh, cannabis. Now, why would uh, synthetic cannabinoids cause psychosis? Well, if we look at the acute effects of THC, on dopaminergic function, so the active ingredient in, in marijuana, uh, THC tends to increase dopaminergic content by increasing uh, presynaptic dopamine synthesis as well as dopamine release. So if we look at what synthetic cannabinoids do, dopaminergically and otherwise, there's a wide range of potential uh, activities, not only increasing dopaminergic release, but having other effects like having some monoamine oxidase inhibition, uh, having some effects on serotonergic receptors, glycine receptors, uh, a number of different pathways that might be relevant to the development of psychosis, suggesting that although we now know that cannabis has some liability for psychosis, uh, there's mechanistic reasons to think that synthetic cannabinoids might have a greater risk. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk a bit about epidemiology now. Here in the United States, a um, number of different studies have come out in the past decade or so. In 2015, a survey of U.S. high school students found that about 3% were current users of synthetic cannabinoids, uh, and that made it the third most frequently used drug uh, behind only alcohol and cannabis. In 2011, a study of college students at the University of Florida uh, reported that about 8% of students had ever tried synthetic cannabinoids. <clears throat> 
and internationally in 2013, a online survey reported that 17 respondents, now of course, 17% of respondents, now of course, that's a, a biased sample of people who agreed to respond to the survey, but suggesting that almost 20% of respondents um, were using synthetic cannabinoids. So one of the sort of at-risk uh, populations tends to be younger people who are using these uh, compounds in large part because, especially when they first came out, they were sold as legal highs. So younger people thought, well, you know, I may, might not get into smoking marijuana necessarily because I could get in trouble, but I'll try these other legal highs uh, as, as a way to um, sort of dabble in that without getting into trouble. <clears throat> this is a 2016 study that shows the uh, percentage of adolescents, this is again here, here in the United States, uh, between the years of 2011 and 2015, how many of them had used cannabinoids. And you can see that the percentage ranged from anywhere from about 2% up to 13, 14%, and the, that rate increased with the age of the uh, student. So high school seniors here in this range, again, depending on the year, about 5 to almost 15%. Now, here in the United States, there have also been um, what some people have called outbreaks, these sort of clustered outbreaks of reported cases of synthetic cannabinoid use associated with adverse effects. So if you look here at the number of cases, you can see that in Colorado in 2013, <clears throat> several hundred patients uh, came up with adverse events and these sort of clusters had continued throughout uh, 2015. Likewise, if you look at calls to poison control centers, specifically about synthetic cannabinoids, uh, between the years of 2011 and 2015, that sort of cycled up and down, really peaking in 2015. I've not seen great data since then. Uh, it does appear like the numbers have decreased a bit, um, but certainly in this era, this was sort of the peak time of uh, synthetic cannabinoid use. And uh, some of these clustered outbreaks did attract um, widespread attention. There was a, an outbreak that took place in New York in uh, 2016 that was described by the New York Times as a uh, causing a zombie-like state where people were found sort of ambling about the streets, disoriented, confused, psychotic. That um, phenomenon was written up in the New England Journal of Medication, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and it was found that that was attributed to a specific new synthetic cannabinoid called a AMB Fubinaca. Here in Los Angeles, where I am, uh, likewise in 2016, uh, there was a similar clustered outbreak that occurred on a so-called Skid Row. This is an area of town where many homeless people live and homeless services are uh, centered. <coughs> um, and uh, that, in terms of epidemiology, revealed that in addition to young people, another at-risk demographic is um, people uh, who are economically challenged, who are homeless, because these are um, ways to use recreational dr drugs that on average are cheaper than other kinds of drugs. So it suggests that synthetic cannabinoids, um, that the homeless population is uh, especially vulnerable. This is a nice slide from a recently published paper that shows a kind of timeline with a bit of more of an international perspective. So <clears throat> again, THC isolated in the 1960s, synthesis of synthetic cannabinoids starting in the 60s into the 70s, 80s. Legislatively, um, uh, spice products were, uh, sorry, my son's woken up. Um, Spice was banned in the U.S. in um, in several states in the U.S. in two 2010. Um, Europe certainly took notice and uh, reported that uh, new synthetic cannabinoids were linked to multiple or hundreds of different poisonings, including some deaths um, in Europe. In Poland, more than 2,000 hospital emergencies reported in 2015. In Turkey, 563 deaths related to synthetic ca cannabinoids reported. Uh, curiously, although most, uh, as I'll show in a subsequent slide, most uh, countries and uh, states here in the U.S. have banned these synthetic compounds. Uh, spice was made legal for personal use in Romania in 2018. 
And so you can see that this is certainly an international uh, phenomenon. So I'm going to close the talk by talking a bit more about legislation and about uh, public health efforts to cur curtail use. When these products were first came out, they were typically sold in what we call here in the US head shops um, or on the internet with no age restrictions. And they were often used by young people, as I mentioned, as a sort of legal way to get high, uh, to evade drug testing. Uh, and because actually their perceived safety due to the adverse effects, uh, uh, effects that were noted, the Drug Enforcement Agency here in the US placed five synthetic cannabinoids on a 12-month ban, eventually put them on our Schedule One list, effectively making it illegal to possess or have them. However, what we saw from 2011 to 2010 is the companies that um, make these compounds really just shifted uh, their strategy and they uh, started to put other types of synthetic cannabinoids in their products. So that it, this is what I call the, the moving target, um, sort of tends to evade um, the, the legislation that's attempts, attempting to ban it. So for example, um, this paper talks says that one unique characteristic of spice is its ever-changing composition. It's a whack-a-mole problem. I don't know if that's an international thing that's a game where a little mole comes up and you try to whack it with a hammer and it, it's very difficult. <laughs> so you ban one form of the drug and another two will pop up instantly. Here in the US by 2011, all branches of the US military had banned synthetic cannabinoids. It was well known that prior to that time, the rate of use of synthetic cannabinoids was very high in the military, again, because it was initially something that was legal. Most states here in the U.S. now have some types of laws prohibiting the sale or possession of synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, however, it's not clear that that kind of legislation has actually slowed down the use. Uh, one study uh, from 2016 found that a citywide ban in Texas actually resulted in a paradoxical increase in synthetic presentations, uh, synthetic cannabinoid presentations to ERs and such. And you can see these are some advertisements just pulled off of the internet uh, saying like, look, our products are 100% legal. <clears throat> uh, and it says things like it does not contain the prohibited ingredients, but of course it does contain other ingredients. So it's estimated that there are, um, Last, last I read, there are about 600 different synthetic cannabinoid compounds out there. Uh, if we look at the uh, FDA or the DEA here in the US, there's at least 70, if not many more, um, of these compounds that are not, have not been placed on the ban. So this is the, this idea of a moving target. And so basically each year, uh, just different synthetic cannabinoids come onto the market. And so I think this is the final slide just to round out with more international perspective. Uh, the UK, Australia, Germany first imposed uh, bans on synthetic cannabinoids in 2009. Since that time, bans have followed in France, Luxembourg, Poland, Lithuania, Sweden, Estonia, Australia, Portugal. I'm sure there's other countries uh, on this list as well. But as with the US, uh, it's not clear that these bans have significantly decreased the use of synthetics. Um, oops, not, not the final slide. I think this is the second to last slide. So this is data from the US, again, showing the, the number of different synthetic cannabinoids and also includes the synthetic cathinones that were discussed in the previous lecture, how that has increased um, between the years of 2009, 2015. Here on the right, we see data from Europe where you can see, again, we're up to many hundreds of different types of uh, synthetic cannabinoids that are, are in circulation uh, in Europe. And so by way of conclusion, synthetic cannabinoids are one of the fastest growing and profitable drug markets worldwide. Although a relatively small proportion of the population uses them, they have particular appeal for young people and they've been recently associated with clustered epidemics, uh, most notably here in the US in homeless population. The ever-changing composition of these products continues to thwart legislative efforts aimed at curtailing use. And finally, from a clinical standpoint, the wide range of different synthetic cannabinoids out there makes predicting clinical effects very difficult. And so I will end there and say thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Joe Pierre, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation about synthetic cannabinoids. And uh, we will now continue to our last presenter, uh, our last speaker, Dr. Carla Lusikoy, a senior psychiatrist from Jakarta Drug Dependence Hospital, Indonesia. I would like to invite Dr. Carla to give her presentation. Dr. Carla, can you turn your camera, turn on your camera? Okay, uh, something happened with my camera. Okay, I tried to uh, okay. give my presentation. Okay, good afternoon. First, I want to give my gratitude for the opportunity to share my experience with all of you. Uh, I am uh, Carla from Drug Dependence Hospital, Jakarta. Okay. Allow me to start my presentation with giving you a trans report based on the United Nations report on the new, uh, on the new psychoactive substance trends in South East. Southeast Asia and Indonesia to give a brief idea of the earth and the situation we are currently in. One of the growing challenges for government in Southeast Asia is the safe disposal of seized drugs and chemical. This is due to varying capacity of each country to enforce the law and maintain a certain procedure for the latter. Therefore, uh, this gap of law enforcing capabilities in countries in Southeast Asia have been exploited to expand the synthetic drugs market. As of December 2020, 46% of total 1,047 individual NPS has been reported in East and Southeast Asia and synthetic cannabinoid take up to 31 of NPS in East and Southeast Asia. As for Indonesia, methamphetamine account for the largest proportion of drug-related arrests in Indonesia, but synthetic cannabinoid dominate the NPS market in Indonesia. Nearly half a ton of synthetic cannabinoid and more than a ton of methamphetamines state in 2020. One of the most popular synthetic cannabinoids in Indonesia is Tembako Gorilla, or Gori uh, for short. To prevent and control circulation of okay. NPS, Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. To prevent and control circulation of NPS, Indonesia has included NPS in its law as narcotic category one and two in the Minister of Health Law number uh, law number four in 2021. This is a tembakau gorilla the most popular synthetic cannabinoid in Indonesia. First, I want to note that uh, in this presentation, I prefer to use the term synthetic cannabinoid, not synthetic marijuana, because sometimes synthetic marijuana can often be misleading to plant itself, whereas the synthetic cannabinoid is man-made substance. A synthetic cannab cannabinoid dominates the market in Indonesia. Allow, uh, allow me to redirect your attention to matter of the synthetic cannabinoid for a while. Uh, we heard before that uh, uh, 
there is a cert certain degree of distinction between synthetic cannabinoid and synthetic marijuana. Synthetic cannabinoid are human-made, mind-altering chemical that are either sprayed on dried, shredded plant uh, so they can be smoked or sold as liquid to be uh, vaporized or inhaled in uh, e-cigarette or other devices. Sometimes in the market, people often use spice or K2 to brand synthetic cannabinoid. The interesting in synthetic cannabinoid began with the complete synthetic of THC in 1965 by McCollum and Gaoni. So it has been around for quite some time. Uh, Synthetic cannabinoids are referred to as substances with structural features which allow binding to one of the non cannabinoid receptor, and then that is CB1 or CB2. And it is reported to have um, a really higher binding affinity for CB1 receptor, means that act as full agonist. The synthetic cannabinoids are generally administered by smoking. According to the instruction found on packet of uh, spice, the product, the product were not meant uh, to be used for human consumption. Nevertheless, many users are reported uh, to have smoked or taken the product orally to become uh, intoxicated. Upon using synthetic cannabinoids, acute advert effect occurred uh, three hours on average, and it will con uh, intoxication occur with concentration ranging from 1.1 to 950 na nanograms per milliliter. The effect on synthetic cannabinoids includes neuropsychotic, panic attacks, suicidal ideation, cognitive impairment, um, cardiovascular impairment, neurology, and other physical, physical side effects. Synthetic cannabinoids use show deficiency in a variety of high order cognitive function, including uh, walking memory, attention, and recall. Another study indicates that synthetic cannabinoid user who had acute psychotic disorder induced by synthetic cannabinoid show cognitive impairment similar to those of schizophrenia patient. And since synthetic cannabinoid contains psychoactive compounds which have much higher affinity at CB1 receptor, it is not surprisingly that there are several reports that indicate an association between synthetic cannabinoid use and serious cardiovascular problems, such as myocardial infarction and tachycardia, uh, fine in adults and adolescents. Uh, uh, this is a current situation in um, our hospital. At Jakarta Dependent Hospital, synthetic cannabinoid cases take up to 15 until 25 of the total cases. This number is based on GCMS test taken on patient upon entering our facility. Although this number is relative uh, small, it should not be noted that Indonesian government has not yet subsidized this test on our national health assurance. Uh, it means that the patient who can afford to pay for GCM is, GCMS test, testing will not get uh, GCMS testing. Throughout 2018 until 2021, the highest type of synthetic cannabinoid that identified in patient are pinaka, 5-fluoro, and pubinaka. It accounts for more than 
20% of the statistic. Again, I should restate that this data based on GCMS testing uh, that was administered to the patient who can afford to pay to be tested. Patient who admit using synthetic cannabinoid or was found to using synthetic cannabinoid through GCMS admit that they have at least they uh, have experienced the following symptoms. First, the psychiatric symptoms such as agitation, confusion, psychotic, suicidal ideation, and extreme anxiety. And uh, the physical symptoms uh, like rapid heartbeat, seizure, hypertension, chest pain, nausea, and vomiting. So what is the appropriate treatment approach? We often hear the word changing formula. But if I want to speak in a layman's uh, term, I think I can say that there is no single uh, treatment in right for everyone. There is a gu guideline, but a guideline must be combined with our assessment and diagnosis toward the patient. To be able to assess and diagnosis thoroughly, we should note several things. So, how do we diagnose the patient? I like to put the phrase, finding balance between our knowledge and the patient's information. We can rely solely on our knowledge without the patient information, nor we can rely solely on the patient information. So first, we should find out as thorough as possible the patient history of exposure. Diagnosing synthetic cannabinoid related illness without a history of exposure is challenging. It is a clinical diagnosis, but it has no well-defined toxicology syndrome. And another importance uh, of finding out patient history of exposure is patient with a history of mental illness or prior history of drug abuse are at higher risk of developing severe illness from synthetic cannabinoid use. Second, we should always consider the possibility of alternative medical diagnosis since synthetic cannabinoid related illness can be present in altered mental status. In addition to both approaches, we also consider that synthetic cannabinoids are not detectable on the most standard in-house hospital drug screen. In 2014, a survey was conducted and nearly 400 participants who are asked why they use synthetic cannabinoid. 71% said because they could get high without having to worry about flunking a drug test, as Dr. Pierre has stated before. For the treatment, there is no single right treatment for everyone because uh, the formula always uh, changing. So uh, for treatment, first, uh, synthetic cannabinoid related illness has no specific antidote. And since the challenges we are facing right now in terms of treating patients who use NPS or synthetic cannabinoid are our unfamiliarity with synthetic drugs and their effect. Synthetic, uh, different synthetic cannabinoids are associated with different adverse health effects including agitation, delirium, uh, cardiac arrhythmia, seizure, renal insufficiency. Without proper knowledge and experience, we are very prone to misdiagnose. And the most important, we should update our bucket of uh, knowledge 
the rise of new psychoactive substance is extremely high. Therefore, we should keep ourselves up to uh, overcome the challenges in diagnosis and treatment. Sorry, okay. Uh, this is uh, uh, here, here. Here is the concluding remarks. First, hospital and health facility need to have updated technology capable of testing for more than just metabolite of THC, the active ingredients in marijuana, which is not found in synthetic cannabinoids. Number two, we need to update our knowledge regarding the new psychoactive substances and especially in Indonesia about synthetic cannabinoids. The last but not least, always dig deeper, uh, meaning that we should find as much, uh, as much information as possible for every patient, whether it includes patient history or our capability of diagnosing the patients. Okay. Thank you for the, your attention. And once again, it is an honor to share it with you. Thank you, Dr. Carla, for sharing the knowledge about uh, synthetic cannabinoids and the situation in Indonesia, and also the management of uh, synthetic cannabinoid use. I would like uh, to invite uh, all the speakers to turn on the camera, since we are now going to be in um, to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. Thank you. We have some questions uh, from the uh, question screen. Uh, the first one, uh, a question for Professor Afif. Uh, it's from, from Prince Davis from Liberia. Uh, can, the question is, can we find tablet K in Africa? Maybe uh, uh, which countries that oh, we can find the case of tablet K, Professor? Can you repeat the question? The, the question is whether you can find the table K where? Tablet K in Africa. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't have any uh, any evidence for that. So, uh, is there any other countries that uh, we can find the case of uh, tablet K use? You mentioned that it was found in Afghanistan. Yeah, but I, I haven't seen any indication that it is widespread now. Um, we have to check it out. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, so the next question is for Dr. Joe Pierre. So uh, here's the questions from Remedy Max from Canada. The question is: uh, the study subjects in the in the study you cite. Were the, were the subject relatively free from prior mental or physical conditions? Uh, asking to see if the synthetic cannabis exacerbated pre-existing condition or created new adverse medical condition in relatively healthy subjects? Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is really all of the above. Um, so whether we're talking about psychiatric patients or patients with somatic or physical symptoms, uh, those types of adverse events have been reported in people both with pre-existing disease as well as without. So uh, I mentioned this briefly, but certainly when we talk about the psychotic effects, uh, it's well known that that can exacerbate psychosis in people who have pre-existing psychotic disorders, but there also is a large number of case reports on new onset psychosis in people who have not had any previous psychotic episodes. Likewise, when we talk about the physical symptoms, keeping in mind that 
demographically, at least here in the United States, many of the users are people on the young side. Uh, these are, in general, um, oftentimes very healthy people who develop uh, somatic symptoms, whether we're talking about cardiac or renal or other things. Um, now, of course, with people who have pre-existing pre disease, that's just sort of asking for more trouble, but it's not certainly not exclusive to people who have uh, pre-existing disease. Yeah, so it, it can also uh, trigger in uh, healthy healthy people the symptoms. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, um, as you imagine, it, I, it's a it's a dose related effect, and so as Dr. Carla mentioned, um, you know, you might have one synthetic cannabinoid that is relatively has moderate effects at cannabinoid receptors or at other um, you know or, organ systems, but you might have another one that's a hundred times more potent to that. So it, I think it's less about the individual and their pre-existing disease and more about what compound you, you're using. And of course, the user has no idea what compound they're using. Mm -hmm. um, speaking about the psychotic symptoms arise uh, related to the, uh, the use of the synthetic cannabinoids, is there any differences between uh, psychotic symptoms, or is there any special features of psychotics uh, caused by these uh, synthetic cannabinoids uh, comparing to other psychotic uh, conditions like schizophrenia, maybe? I mean, from my experience, the patients that I've seen, um, you know, pertinent to the previous question, I've seen people with psychotic symptoms who have psychotic disorders already, in which case then it becomes that much more ambiguous as to, you know, is this phenomenologically different? In the clinical population that I work with, uh, methamphetamine use is by far much, much more common than synthetic cannabinoid use. Um, so I see a wide variety of different psychotic disorders, whether it's schizophrenia or amphetamine-induced psychosis, cocaine-induced psychosis. Um, and again, these diagnoses are often not mutually exclusive. I might have a patient who uses methamphetamines and synthetic cannabinoids, or I might have someone with schizophrenia. So I think, the, as Dr. Carla suggested, it's really about heterogeneity. And I would not say that in my experience, I can look at somebody and say, oh, well, he has this type of psychotic syndrome, and therefore I'm thinking that it's probably you know, bath salts, or I'm thinking that it's synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, I don't think it's that specific because what, what you really just see is people with a lot of different symptoms. Uh, maybe doc, Dr. Carla has a, her own perspective on that, I'm sure. Yes, uh, so there's various symptoms of psychotics. Uh, maybe Dr. Carla, you want to add uh, more about psychotic symptoms? And also, um, I would like to know about the management. Is it, um, do, Dr. Joe Pierre mentioned about uh, giving Haloperidol, uh, maybe you have uh, some points about this? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, with my experience, uh, I would like to say that the, uh, especially for the uh, psychotic symptoms, it's really, ex uh, it's really high. I mean, uh, the symptoms is very, very uh, extensive. And uh, for the treatment, uh, because there is no antidote for it, we can use uh, all kinds of antipsychotic, but if the uh, patient with uh, full of agitation, it's better for use haloperidol injection for the first. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carla. Well, this is another question. Uh, this is for all the speakers. Maybe you would like to answer all. In addition to educating treating physicians and hospital staff on how to recognize the uh, synthetic cannabis poisoning or the psychostimulant poisoning, what other public education awareness campaign have been undertaken? For example, reaching young people early enough before they start exper experimenting. Many do not know the, uh, the adverse effects long term especially. So uh, maybe Professor Afif, would you like to answer this? Yes, uh, my, my experience is with uh, working with, with education authorities is that uh, I used to give a description of the symptoms of synthetic uh, 
cannabinoids and synthetic psychostimulants to school teachers. And also uh, in, a, in each school, we have someone who is responsible for um, counseling for, uh, uh, for drug users. And so um, uh, educational authorities are aware of the symptoms. Uh, they also have a hotline if someone has um, severe medical problems, they, they call the Israeli Anti-Drug Authority, which is also is a source of information to parents, to educators, to health authorities. So I had quite a few referrals of people who use synthetic cannabinoids to my, uh, from the Israeli Anti-Drug Authority, uh, especially severe cases, also of psychosis and uh, uh, severe health problems, tremors and others. And uh, the, there is an issue with the ER, whether they are fully aware of the symptoms of the different uh, drugs, and uh, they need to be constantly updated about the, the new compounds and, um, and also about possible treatments of uh, people who are um, who are admitted to the ER units. So it, it is a, it's a major issue of how to, uh, to deliver this knowledge to all these, uh, all these groups and authorities in order to improve the detection and treatment. And also, uh, we also try to spread the, um, the evidence about the, uh, the chronic effects and the acute um, uh, health effects of these drugs in the community. And there's a growing awareness, for example, how damaging is synthetic cannabinoids. We have had several cases of death, especially when people use other, uh, uh, when they use synthetic cannabinoids, there are other substances that are quite harmful and uh, there's a growing public awareness of it now. Well, thank you, Professor Afif, uh, for, for your opinion. Maybe Dr. Joe Pierre, you would like to add more opinion on this? Sure. Um, you know, I can't say much about public health campaigning, at least not here in the United States. You know, I, I would say that um, you know, internationally, I think there's been a, a effort to try to educate people about just regular cannabis, right, and it and its psychotic risk, uh, because even that is not, I think, widely embraced by the, by the public. I think the both when we talk about cannabis as well as synthetic cannabinoids, there is a sort of misperception that these are relatively safe things. And so I think we as clinicians have to help uh, educate the public about that. And I think public health campaigns are a good idea. I just have not really seen them implemented, at least not here in the US. I think the main clinical point, just to echo Dr. Weinstein, is um, I think we have to remember to ask patients about these things. You know, when we inquire about drug use, we, you know, often talk about things like alcohol or marijuana or cocaine or methamphetamines, but you have to ask people. And particularly when we're talking about synthetic cannabinoids, which as I mentioned, are these herbal compounds, we often don't ask about herbals. You know, are you taking, are you drinking some kind of tea or you, so you have to really fold it into your questioning about spice products because people might not think, oh, that's something I should mention to the doctor. It's not a drug per se. So we have to ask, and then as Dr. Carla mentioned, you know, at our institution, we do have the ability to do urine drug testing, but it's a specific test that you have to order. As mentioned, it's not part of a typical urine drug panel. And uh, what we also don't know uh, is, as I mentioned, there's probably 600, maybe 700 different synthetic cannabinoids. I'm reasonably certain that your standard test, or not your standard, your test, doesn't test for all 700. So even there might be a negative result on a, on a urine drug screen, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person wasn't using. So our ability to detect use relies on both laboratory testing as well as talking to patients about it. And that's really, I think, as clinicians, the, the best we can do. Yeah, thank you. So we have to explore more about the history uh, of the patient because we cannot rely uh, on the laboratory, uh, especially the standard urine test. Uh, this here is a uh, question for Professor Afif. Uh, respecting tablet, tablet K, uh, applying urine drug test, will it appear as amphetamine or opioid? Uh, how many days back with, uh, will it trace? 
Well, I don't have any data, but uh, it should do, do because if these are uh, this should appear in a, in a urine test similar to other substances. I just want to revert to the previous question. I've, I've checked again, and uh, currently there is no evidence that it has widespread to Africa and other countries, but there are uh, well-known routes of uh, uh, drug sa sales from Afghanistan to the world. So they, if it will, uh, they might use the same drug routes for, for selling tablet K. But we don't know much about it. We, we only know a little bit about its uh, manufacturer in Afghanistan. Uh, I would just add that I think with urine drug testing, synthetic stimulants do not necessarily uh, come out positive for when you're testing for methamphetamine. So again, at our institution, we have specific tests for not only synthetic cannabinoids, but also synthetic stimulants. The challenge with stimulants is also that we're not talking about one compound, right? Cathions are one of the major uh, chemicals that are included in the, the class of synthetic stimulants, but there's also compounds like mephedrone. And so there's a similar problem where you might have a specific test that tests for one thing, and that doesn't necessarily detect uh, other types of, of similar types of, of drugs that are out there in these kind of products. Yes, I think it's uh, the problem of uh, urine drug, drug testing because it the 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 contain it contain the content is changing, right? right? The new psychoactive stimulants, yeah, it's always changing, like you mentioned in your uh, slides before. So uh, there's a lot of uh, questions in the question pane, but uh, I think this one is. Yeah, this one is interesting. Uh, this is for Dr. Joe again, Dr. Joe Pierre. As a researchers in NPS, do you foresee a society that NPS will decline in the near future with increase in technology use? This is for, from Dr. Elizabeth Katam, a lecturer in curriculum study, Kenyatta University. Well, uh, I'm always very careful. I never try to predict the future. I think human beings and even experts are notoriously bad at predicting the future. But what I will will say by a general comment is that you know human beings for millennia uh, like to use psychoactive substances. And partly what we're seeing here with this synthetic phenomenon is just evidence that people are always looking for a new thing, a new kind of high. And as I mentioned, some of the appeal, particularly in young people with synthetic cannabinoids, uh, is this perception that it might be safer or might be legal. Or So that's my way of saying that no, I think in general, I don't think we can expect that people are going to be using fewer illicit drugs or psychoactive compounds. And it's back to the whack-a-mole problem. If we see a lower use of let's say synthetic cannabinoids, which I think actually we have seen evidence of that here in the US in the past couple of years, but that just means now we're seeing more methamphetamine use, you know? So it's this, again, the whack-a-mole problem. You fix this problem and this one comes up. And so I'm not particularly optimistic um, about you know, decreased rates of, of drug use. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Pia. Well, I think because the limitation of time, uh, well, I still have one question. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, does law enforcement have positive impact on the reduction of substance abuse? Maybe each speaker would like to give uh, their opinions. Dr. Carla, maybe you want to give your opinions. Does law enforcement have positive impact? Um, uh, maybe. Yeah, minimize, I think, yeah, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, because changing formula. That's why um, uh, every every day uh, uh, every day uh, needs uh, sorry takes time to put in uh, law enforcement. That's it, uh, Dr. Afina. Thank you, Dr. Carla. Professor Afif, maybe you would like to give your opinions about the law enforcement effects. The impact of law enforcement. I'm sorry, I just had a, some problem in hearing you, and now I'm back. Could you please repeat the question? Okay, the question is: uh, 
does law enforcement have positive impact on the reduction of substance use? Yes, um, there was a there was a long process in Israel uh, to put all the NPs as, as uh, in the market as dangerous substances, and as a result, they used to be sold in in small uh, shops, and now it is illegal, and as a result, people cannot just go and buy it in stores, but uh, now people buy it on the internet and it's very difficult to track um, those who sell it over the internet. They come with a and sell you what they want to sell you. Uh, but definitely um, law enforcement has been very effective in reducing the number of NPs used here. Um, but bearing in mind that the whole drug uh, drug abuse uh, field is very complicated. There are lots of people who work in it and uh, manufacture it, especially in the Far East, and it's very difficult to um, to control this market. It's, it's quite a lucrative, expensive uh, market by, on itself. Thank you, Professor Afif. And Dr. Joe Pierre, would you like to give your opinion on this? Sure. I mean, this obviously it's a great question, but a very complicated answer, right? We could all probably give an hour-long lecture on the effect of uh, you know, legalization, uh, and certainly there's arguments in both ways, right? Maybe we should legalize all drugs, and that'll you know solve the problem. Some some people argue. I, I would just say, from my perspective, you know, aside from alcohol, and here in uh, where I live in the United States in California, we also have legalized the recreational use of cannabis. So if we push alcohol to the side and we push cannabis to the side, the vast majority of my patients are using drugs that are illegal. So I think that illustrates the limitations of legislation or what you're calling law enforcement. Um, I'm not saying that there's not some utility of that. I think you can implement legislation in a way that can be helpful, um, but it's certainly not the only answer. Uh, we know very clearly that just making something illegal or sending people to jail or prison for using, that's not a solution by itself. And I think as mental health professionals, what we have to do, I think what we do is try to understand on an individual level what it is that leads somebody to drug use, uh, whether it's social issues, family issues, individual issues, psychiatric comorbidity, what have you. And that's where our responsibility and our ability to intervene lies as clinicians is addressing those things. I just want to add that I was referring to the use of new psychoactive substances, not marijuana. In, in case of marijuana, there is a process of decriminalization in Israel in which you would not be persecuted if you use cannabis for personal use. And there's a major debate whether to include, whether to allow a le a legal use of cannabis in the country. And one of the issues is uh, the effects on youth, on driving, risks of psychosis and panic attacks, for example. So there's a major debate going on. And it's not like in California or Oregon or Colorado in the US. OK. Um... I think that, uh, that is the last uh, questions that we can discuss uh, today. Uh, so thank you again for Professor Afif Weinstein, Dr. Joe Pierre, and Dr. Carlyle Lusikoy for answering those questions and also for the great presentations. So this concludes the webinar. And uh, on behalf of ISAP, and also I would like to say thank you for all participants to, uh, for attending this webinar and we hope you have learned and also enjoyed this presentation. See you on the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.